Well, thank you, Chris, for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for being here, and thanks for being on the front lines of this fight. And good afternoon, my fellow liberty-loving, responsible gun-owning, red-blooded Americans. It's great to be with you here in my home state, the state of Texas. But I must add, it's also nice to escape Washington, D.C. for a little while, where the facts don't always seem to matter. It's nice to be at home with people like you, people that really understand for a change what it means to live in the land of the free. But we know freedom is never the easy way. It's hard. We've got to be willing to step up and flex a little muscle. We have to be willing to take some hard licks, too, especially when it comes to our right to bear arms. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you know it's a battle we're in. The Second Amendment is under attack. There are those today trying to shut us up and shut us down. That's why we have to fight hard to protect the Second Amendment each and every day. The NRA, I assure you, does not give up, and we can't either. Well, I want to talk to you about how we persevere and why we persevere. And I'll mention two examples. <coughs> They both live in a town about four hours south of here, a town that you've heard a lot about since last November the 5th. Tomorrow, this little town is breaking ground on a new church, a bigger one with a bell tower. The reason they're rebuilding is because last fall, the unthinkable happened. A maniac, a madman actually, walked into a Sunday morning church service and killed 26 people. We all remember that First Baptist Church. We all remember Sutherland Springs. Well, one of the wounded, David Kalbath, was shot eight times, including on his right dominant side, or what David would tell you is his shooting side. So you think he would never recover, but, and you think he might never fire a gun again, but you would be wrong, because David loves shooting. He's been hunting deer with his family practically his whole life. So he's now going through the difficult process of learning to shoot with, from the other side with his left hand. Well, according to David, he's relearning how to shoot not only because he loves hunting, but also because he wants to protect his family. Ladies and gentlemen, what an amazing story. Let's hear it for David. And as you've heard, there's another example from Sutherland Springs, someone that the media elites and Michael Bloomberg don't want to acknowledge and would prefer to ignore. That's right, people who've never picked up a gun, much less visited a community like Sutherland Springs would prefer not to talk about Stephen Williford, who was honored earlier this afternoon. <coughs> because short and simple, Stephen Williford is the hero that stopped the shooter at First Baptist Church. <laughs> Stephen saved lives that day. His daughter said she heard some shots coming from the church about a block away. So Stephen grabbed his AR-15 out of his gun safe. I think I got that right, Stephen. He grabbed eight cartridges and sprinted barefoot straight to the church. And when he got there, he saw that the gunman was wearing armor, body armor, and he had to shoot in the gaps in the armor. Only someone that, with extensive training could have made those kinds of shots. I think Stephen called them well-placed shots. Well, I'm glad that Stephen was trained by the NRA as a firearms instructor. <laughs> and 
And I know he told me he has taught his whole family how to responsibly use firearms. But if it wasn't for Stephen and his AR-15, more lives would have been lost that day. But of course, you're not gonna read that in the New York Times. Here's the simple fact. Guns can save lives, plain and simple. And good guys and gals with guns can and do stop bad guys and gals with guns. <laughs> Stephen is proof of that. By some estimates, there are three million defensive gun uses, uses each year in this country. People who use their guns to protect their family and their property. But you might not have read that in the mainstream media. They're not gonna tell you that it's not just men who are owning guns and know how to use them, it is women as well. The number of women taking concealed carry courses has risen by 24% recently, the biggest jump in years. Trust me. Trust me, I know, because one of these women is my wife of 38 years, Sandy Cornyn. And that's just one of the reasons why I'm the chief Senate sponsor of constitutional concealed carry reciprocity. Of course, it will allow people with concealed carry privileges in one state to exercise those same rights in other states, like a driver's license, for example. So this is just common sense. Well, you may have heard about a single mom a few years ago who was pulled over by the police in New Jersey. She had her handgun in the car, which she bought to protect herself after having been robbed. Having the gun would have been no big deal if she had been in Pennsylvania because she had a license to carry in that state. But because her permit wasn't recognized in New Jersey, she was charged with unlawful possession, a felony. That situation is just wrong. A mother risking jail time for exercising a fundamental constitutional right. That's what we're hoping to change with my bill. There's so much confusion out there right now, folks. So many interest groups, so many people with hidden agendas. There's also, as we know, a straightforward effort to undermine the status and meaning of the Second Amendment. And we need to push back. We can't just ignore the Second Amendment when you feel like it any more than you could the rest of the Bill of Rights. The freedom of association, the freedom to of religion, the freedom of the press, those are all part of the Bill of Rights along with the Second Amendment. And that's also why it's so critical we continue to see the President nominate and the Senate confirm judges who will apply the law as written by our founders. But that begs the obvious question, if our Constitution guarantees the right to keep and bear arms, why not embrace responsible gun ownership? That ought to be our emphasis. Instead, we hear hypocrisy from Hollywood celebrities who lecture us on guns, even though they make millions of dollars starring in violent movies. We hear it from corporate America that engages in silly PR stunts that attempt to punish gun owners who want to buy a legal product like any other American. And of course, now we're hearing that the big banks and credit card companies may track our gun purchases. Well, we really are at a crossroads. 
When it comes to the Second Amendment, we are at a critical turning point and its future is in our hands. You've heard it before and I will say it again, this November, there's a real danger that Democrats could flip the Congress, the House, or the Senate. Can you imagine the anti-gun agenda that a liberal from New York City would bring to the Senate floor if he was in charge? Well, we can't let that happen. And it really is in our hands whether we show up and vote our conscience and our principles at the polls in November when it comes to the midterm congressional elections. So let me just say thank you for letting me stop by and say a few words and to be with you today. I'll just encourage you to continue to make sure your voices are heard, that you share your stories and start changing people's minds. Spread the message that support for the Second Amendment and support for public safety are one in the same. And I know I don't need to tell you this, but I will anyway. Never back down from the fight. Refuse to be silenced. Never fail to show people who haven't grown up around guns the real value of their constitutional rights, their freedom, and the shooting sports. We live in a big, beautiful, bold country. Let's keep it that way. Thank you, and may God bless all of you, and may God continue to bless the great state of Texas.